These are some of the last words that Jesus said to his disciples before he went and died on the cross. He said, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. We're sent by our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. And we're not greater than he is. He's the greatest. But we're not, the servant's not greater than his master, and he that is sent is not greater than he who sent him. The Father sent the Son, and the Son has sent us into the world to be a testimony for what he did and for what he continues to do in our lives. So tonight, we're going to be starting a new three-part series on the book of Job chapter 29 and so our focus tonight will be on gratitude and I hope you will have an ear to hear what God has to say to your heart let's open with prayer and then get into the message dear Lord thank you for bringing us all here safely Lord to hear your precious holy word Lord I just pray that you would continue to work in our lives Lord. we know and all have sinned and have come short of your glory, Lord. And our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, Lord. But you still show up in our lives every moment, every hour, every day. Let your glory be present in this house of God. And let your glory be present in all of our lives, Lord. As we become continually living sacrifices back to you for what you have done and continue to do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. So we're going to be focusing on one aspect of Job 29 for each first Wednesday of the month for the next three months. And so the first one is gratitude. We're going to be learning about today about maintaining the proper attitude. And then next month about giving, helping the needy. And number three, godliness, living like Jesus. And so tonight we're going to look at some steps to maintaining the proper attitude, that of constant gratitude towards God. And so this series, and any biblical series, really teaches us how to be more like Jesus. Um, Jesus gave thanks. He helped the needy. He was always living in godliness because he's God. And so he's our example. He's our teacher. And the word of God, all of it, points to Jesus. And so tonight, I'm going to try to do my best to do the same, to point everybody to Jesus, because Really, in the end, he, and, he living in me is the one doing the teaching, not me. It's him. And so Hebrews chapter 4 says, The word of God, the sword of the spirit, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so God knows your heart. And he will show you through his word exactly how to be more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the three parts of this series are going to focus on three qualities that Jesus exhibited often in his life. And I hope that you will hear what God has to say to you, and, help that, and I hope that will help you exhibit those qualities in your own life to benefit yourself as well as others. And so part one, gratitude. Today we're going to focus on three aspects of having a gratitude of attitude. An attitude of gratitude. Don't, number one, don't get stuck in the past. Two, give thanks for all things. And three, grow where God plants you. And so we begin part one. I could teach for many hours on the subject of gratitude because the Bible says a lot about gratitude and giving thanks and praise. But we only have 30 minutes, so <laughs> I'm going to briefly touch on these three aspects of gratitude. All right. And so... When I teach, I try to give a scripture to memorize because the, the word is more effective in our lives if we can bring it to mind instantly instead of having to refer back to the word. So here's a verse that's repeated twice in the Bible. You see in 1 Chronicles 16 and in Psalm 105, 
I figured if God wrote it twice, it must be important to remember. And so I believe all scripture is important, but there were certain scriptures that Jesus quoted, and there are certain scriptures that do repeat themselves in the Bible. God repeats himself, but he's not a broken record. He instead is a loving, caring father who emphasizes key learning points that will help us live a life that's holy and blessed. And so I want to live a life that's holy and blessed, and so I try to memorize scripture. And so this scripture says, Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. And so when we make, when we make known his deeds among the people, we're sharing our testimony. And each of us has a testimony, a very unique and often miraculous testimony. And that sometimes it may even be hard to believe the testimony because of the miracles that God works in our lives and all the things that he brings together to save us and to continually be with us and draw us near to him. And so it's so important to share both the gospel and your testimony with others because when we make known God's mighty deeds, he becomes more approachable to others more real, more tangible, and more personal. And so Jesus is a very personal Savior. And when others hear our testimony, they can get to know Jesus on a personal level and know what he's like on a personal level because we're relating real events, real occurrences, real experiences, and God is the most real thing there is. And so, into the message. Gratitude part one, don't get stuck in the past. All right, so have you ever heard the saying, the good old days? <laughs> so many people long for the past. Some so much that they get stuck in it and miss out on the present. And so, they miss out on what God is doing for them and how he's working all things together for their good. And they miss out on the benefits of having an attitude of gratitude. Now, bitterness and dissatisfaction will never lead to the peace and joy that Jesus is always ready to give us when we're grateful. Let's take a look at a biblical example of getting stuck in the past from our scripture, Job chapter 29. So Job longed for the past blessings and presence of the Lord. And we read here, verses 1 through 7, Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, Oh, that I were in, as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me, when his candle shined upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me, when I washed my steps with butter, and the rock poured me out rivers of oil, when I went out to the gate through the city, when I prepared my seat in the street. Now later in the chapter, he says why he was blessed and why he felt the presence of God. It was because he helped them that had no other source of help. That was the main reason he says in this chapter why he was blessed. And we'll get into that next month. But right now, Job is complaining. And he misses the blessings and presence of the Lord that he once enjoyed. He's not satisfied with his present state. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 to do all things without murmurings and disputings. So we should do everything without complaining or murmurings and arguing, which is disputings. And so let's look at the words of the wisest man ever to live besides Jesus on this particular subject. Now Solomon wrote about dwelling on the past and asking God the wrong question, why? The right question to ask God is, what can I do to serve you? Not why, why, why me, why now, why this, why that? That's the wrong question. So in Ecclesiastes 7, Solomon says, Say not thou what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. And so Solomon warned against getting stuck in the past and said that it is unwise. 
Not only is it unwise, it goes against the commandment to do everything without arguing and complaining. So if we're not dwelling on the past, what are we supposed to dwell on? <laughs> the future, maybe, yes, or the present. Good things. There you go. Paul, does anybody remember what Paul wrote in chapter 4, Philippians? If there be any, he said, okay, we'll, re we'll look at that right now. All right, so instead of asking why and dwelling on the past, we think on good and godly things and have trust and hope in God. Philippians 4 says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. So he wrote, Paul wrote, if there be any praise, think on good things. There's praise because the good things we should be thinking on all come from God. We're praising him because he's always good. There's always something to praise God for. He's always constantly doing things for us. Day in, day out, night and day, day and night. He's a good God. He is our hope. We hope and trust in him. And for that, we get blessed, as it says here in Jeremiah 17. It says, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. So when we're complaining, we're not trusting in the Lord. When we're asking why, we're not trusting in the Lord. We're not making him our hope. All right, so part two, give thanks for all things. All right, so we just touched on praise, and praise comes from a heart of thanksgiving. If we're not stuck in the past, we're free to recognize and give thanks for all things God is doing in our lives and the lives of others. We belong to him. We are his. He cares for us, and so we should thank him for it continually. So let's take a look at a verse that expresses how we should be showing our attitude of gratitude. And so thanks and praise are to be given always and forever. Psalm 79 that David wrote says, We thy people and sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. Amen. Amen. We are God's people. We are the sheep of his pasture. Now, he provides the grass that we feed on, and that's mainly the word of God, not the kind of grass that some people out there like to feed on, not, not that kind of grass, the word of God grass. It's a good grass. <laughs> so primarily the word of God, but earthly needs as well. He gives us everything we need and more. Praise God. And when we maintain an attitude of gratitude, we shall give thanks and praise to him to all generations both on earth and in heaven. What do you think they're doing in heaven forever? Praising God, amen. Glory be to God. Hosanna in the highest. I mean, they're just singing praises day in and day out because he loves us day in and day out. And so when we feel his love, when there's no evil, when there's no sin, we're just free to love on God and be loved back and love on each other. We're all gonna be there together, praise God. So. I, it shouldn't be hard to think of many, many reasons to give thanks and praise to the one who created you and who holds your life in his loving hands. All right, so King David, he wrote many times about how good it is to give God thanks and praise. Here's just three examples. Psalm 69 says, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. And so we're thanking God right now. We prayed to God. We sang three songs. I hope that your hearts were touched like mine were by the worship and praise music. Praise God that we have such a great praise team and that, and that we can have melody and sing to God and make a joyful noise for every service as we usher in the presence of God. So we make a joyful noise. It says in Psalm 95, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. And so psalms are songs, and that's what we're doing. We're singing, making a joyful noise, and singing him songs of love. Love back to God because he loves us. All right. 
Psalm 100 says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. This is God's court here. When you enter into the church, you're entering into the court of God. And we should enter his house with praise and thanksgiving. It says, be thankful unto him and bless his name. The scripture we're memorizing says, call upon his name. Make known his deeds unto the people. Give thanks. All right. So notice how praise and thanksgiving go hand in hand. When we sing praises to him, we have a heart of thanksgiving. Or we should. I hope, I hope that all of you in your times of praise and worship have a heart of thanksgiving for all he has done and continue to do for you. Now, he's worthy of our praise. We're only here but by the grace of God. And we only shall live by the blood and the strength of Jesus Christ and our steadfast faith and trust in him. All right. So gratitude part three, grow where God plants you. This third part of maintaining an attitude of gratitude may be the toughest for some. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard the saying, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. So we may have to rebuke a spirit of jealousy when we see others blessed and we feel like we're not blessed. When the enemy plants a desire in our mind for what others have. We have to rebuke that spirit. And so we may have to deal with temptation to quit when the going gets tough. It's tempting to quit, just give up when things get tough. But the Bible is full of encouragement, full of encouragement to never give up, to be happy with what God gives you, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, every day. Every moment, I, we fall short, just like I prayed. All have come short of the glory of God. And our righteousnesses are as, as filthy rags. He's righteous. But when we follow his word, when we obey his voice, we put on his righteousness. We live the life he has planned for us. And so let's grow where he plants us. Let's take a look at some verses on covetousness. Or that's, all, that's also called greed or uncontrolled desire, all right? And so the Bible says to be happy with what you have and where you are. God is our greatest possession. Him and his word are what we should covet or desire most. Hebrews 13 says, let your conversation be without covetousness. In other words, don't talk about the things you want that you don't have. Don't be complaining about the fact that you don't have all everything that you think you need. God's going to give you everything you truly need. All right. <laughs> Be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He is what we truly need. He will never leave us or forsake us. We have him at all times. And he's really all that we need because he's going to bless us with our worldly needs too. That's minor in comparison to what he gives us in his word. And in his voice, when he speaks to us, he comforts us. His presence in all, is all around us. He protects us from, I don't know how many times God has protected me from things that have happened because most of the time I'm not even aware that he's protecting me because it doesn't even come nigh me. The evil doesn't even come nigh me because his hedge of protection is all about me. Just like it was around Job until the devil attacked him, right? And God led him. But he was blessed double. And we're reading in the book of Job today. It's Job 29. Praise the Lord. So Psalm 119 says, Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. So our heart should be desiring the word of God, the precious wisdom and knowledge and understanding that comes when we read the word of God. And God speaks to our heart because it's not our own minds that interpret the word of God and understand the word of God. It's the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. that gives us the understanding. It's his supernatural abilities that are living within us. The gifts of the spirit, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom. All the gifts that live within us are what give us the understanding and the knowledge. He gives us everything we need to live the life he has planned for us. All right. So he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's with us 
And if he's with us, he gives us what we need. If we covet what we don't have, we're not loving God the way he wants us to with our whole heart. Right before the service, God drew me to Ezekiel chapter 23. In Ezekiel chapter 23, there's a story about two daughters of the same mom, Egyptian daughters, Ahola and Aholiba, and they committed adultery with God because they chased after idols and they chased after whoredoms and they did not give God their whole heart. And so God wants your whole heart. He doesn't want you to chase after the things of this world. He doesn't want you to chase after the things that the world is telling you you should be chasing after, the things that the world is telling you you need, when all you need is God and his word. All right, so I just wanted to relate that to you because God showed that to me right as I was praying before the service. He said, talk about these two women. And the end for them was not good. The end for them was terrible. And the end, if you get caught up in the world, you're going to be choked like, like the seed that was choked by the weeds that God talk, Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower. You don't want to be choked. You want to be fruitful and bear fruit a hundredfold, thirtyfold, sixtyfold, a thousandfold. Praise God. So when you feel desire for the things of the world, and everybody's going to be tempted their heart's going to be tempted. Run to the word of God. Run. Flee idolatry. Flee idolatry is what the Bible says. You have to run from the desires of the world because they are so tempting. And um, I know that, I mean, even at my age, I'm still tempted, but I know the young people can be tempted because of peer pressure. It's really a tough thing to see all your friends doing things that they consider to be fun but really it's going to hurt you in the end it's going to hurt your soul it's going to hurt in the future you're going to have regret you know it's just you have to bury yourself in the word of god until god speaks to your heart and has restored the love that you had for him in the beginning when you were saved today and every day he will restore your love for him if you run to him, run to his word, run to him. When we stand the word, it's harder to get up and get caught up in the distractions of the world and the sin and adultery of not live, loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. It truly is adultery because we're cheating on God. We're cheating on God. And he's our husband. He's my husband. And I'm his wife. <laughs> I'm not a lady, but still, he's my husband, all right? And I love him. All right. All right. So being deeply planted and rooted in the house of God causes us to flourish. This part three is grow where you're planted. Now, this slide may be the most important of the entire message. Let's read it. Psalm 92 says, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Now, I know a lady who's bringing forth fruit in her old age. Praise God. She's living for God. Ethelene is living for God every day. And she loves to come to church just like we all do here. I'm so thankful for everybody that's here tonight. Praise God. We are flourishing because we are planted in the house of the Lord. Now, it's so important to be rooted and planted in God's love. The Bible talks about that. But to fully experience it, I believe with all my heart that you have to be rooted and planted in a local church. You have to be active in the house of the Lord. God does not lie. He's not lying here. He says when we're planted in the house of the Lord, we're going to flourish. We're going to bear fruit in our old age. We're going to be fat and flourishing, not fat physically, but our, hopefully our lives will be just blessed all over every aspect of our lives will be blessed and plentiful to where we can bless others with the gospel with our testimony with the word of god praise god with our love and care and we read about washing each other's feet in the beginning we we're here to be servants to serve others to serve god and so we love each other because we're christ followers and we're blessed to be able to regularly fellowship with each other and to hear the word of truth, rightly divided and explained. So don't come to church for me or for pastor, for anybody else but Jesus. 
All right? Now, Jesus is the one that's going to help you flourish and bear fruit for his kingdom. All right? Come for him. He's the one that's going to judge us because we're accountable to him for our actions. All right? So, in review, and I guess the praise team can start coming up. Don't get stuck in the past. Give thanks for all things and grow where God plants you. I know that's a tough one, but you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I know I can because I've done some tough things, but only because he helped me do it. Praise God. In review, okay, um, the key scripture to memorize, in review again, Psalm 105 and 1 Chronicles 16, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. We got to brag about God. We got to brag about Jesus to everybody. Praise God. So memorize this scripture. I hope it'll help you maintain an attitude of gratitude. May God do many mighty deeds through you, your family, for the ones you love, so that you can praise others and make known those deeds and his glory and his amazing never-ending love. May God continue to guide and conform you to the image of Jesus Christ who gave it all for us. Because we believe in him, we have eternal life. Don't forget to obey and trust him with all your hearts. God bless you.